Okay, so today we're there's kind of two two big topics left and one little topic. So the two big topics are coherence theory and treating light of multiple wavelengths, multiple colors, uh, multiple frequencies. Uh, the next topic is treating diffraction, and that that also involves treating light of multiple uh, kind of well, it's multiple k vectors. So up until now, we've pretty much considered either plane waves or waves in the cavity. But if you have a general description of light going somewhere, you can decompose it into a bunch of different directions. Uh, these are the two big topics. So this will probably take a week. The, this, the first topic is treating light of different colors, um, diffraction and treating light of as a sum of plane waves in different directions. That will probably take another week. And the last topic is quantum optics, which I, I think people uh, will enjoy. It sort of involves going back to doing some of the polarization manipulations. And, uh, and then that will be the end. So we'll probably finish the class a little bit early. People will work on the last couple problem sets. Um, and hopefully you'll be able to finish all that before the, the rush at the very end. Because again, this class is two units, not, not three. Um, so, so today and tomorrow, we're going to talk about how to deal with light that's made up of a bunch of different colors or a bunch of different frequencies or a bunch of different wavelengths. And those are all, of course, the same. Um, and we, we've talked about plane waves and we've talked about waves in the cavity. And uh, in a week, we'll talk about sort of arbitrary patterns of light. But as, as is usual, we'll, we'll sort of tweak one thing at a time. So when we considered polarization, we only considered plane wave polarization. Uh, and same thing here, we'll, we'll consider just plane waves, but plane waves of a bunch of different frequencies added together. Uh, and that will, that will just help us uh, get at some of these concepts in the simplest possible context where we don't have to worry about any, any spatial patterns, spatial variations. So of course, plane waves are idealized, they're infinite in extent, but you can think of them as if you spread a laser beam out and only focus on the, on the center, now, yes, the laser beam is actually a Gaussian, but near near the center of that beam, as long as it's spread out quite quite widely, the the wave fronts are very vertical, very uniform. Or light coming from a very distant source, like the sun, certainly is extremely planar. Um, you know, and it it's sort of light coming from something far away on the scale of your experiment looks looks pretty plane wave like. Uh, okay, so. Uh, with that said, you know we're going to stick to plane waves. N note that in the full generality of Maxwell's equations, we could have both multiple frequencies and multiple directions and lots of other stuff going on. But uh, just sticking to plane waves, um, let's let's start to explore what what we mean by these different uh, by different colors and different wavelengths and how do we deal with that. So um, maybe this should be a, a reminder from your previous physics classes, maybe even going back to, uh, to life before mud, but visible light is made up of wavelengths that go from 400 nanometers, and that's sort of blue, violet, up to 800 nanometers. And that's pretty much on the edge of what you can see in red. This is a factor of two. We say this, uh, visible light is just one octave of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, if we were to translate that using the speed of light into a frequency, the longer wavelength slower light oscillates at 375 terahertz. It's like a terabyte is 10 to the 12. A terahertz is 10 to the 12 hertz. And uh, violet light oscillates at Twice that, 750 terahertz. So we're just terahertz. It's 10 to the 12 hertz. And the fastest electronics that we have are gigahertz. So this is hundreds of terahertz, and the fastest electronics we have are gigahertz, 10 to the 9. And you can think about that, you know, your, your processor and your computer or your phone operates at a few gigahertz, um, microwave ovens and microwave electronics, Wi-Fi, 
that operates at a few gigahertz. Um, the fanciest sort of radio astronomy really pushing the envelope on uh, detecting the electric and magnetic fields directly rather than just detecting the intensity. That's probably a hundreds of gigahertz, but we're still three orders of magnitude off from, from optical oscillations. So I stressed this before, but for optics, we only ever measure intensities. We only measure time averages of quantities. Even with our fastest electronics, we can never actually catch the, the waves going up and down for, for optical light. And so there's, there's a lot of tricks we have to do in order to see, see these, uh, these spectra. We have to turn things that are oscillating really fast into things that are maybe changing in some spatial pattern that we can, that we can detect. Um, and so you can't, for example, take a spectrum of an optical thing by looking at it with an oscilloscope or looking at it with a spectrum analyzer. It's just way too fast. So, so there are probably two ways in the past you might have thought about taking spectra of light. You could, of course, pass it, pass it into a prism. If you pass white light or light composed of a bunch of different colors into a prism, it's going to split into different colors. And oops, the red is going to come out in one at one angle, and the blue is going to come out at a different angle. And uh, this this relies on the fact that the index of refraction of this glass is not exactly the same for all the different colors. And so the amount of bending is slightly different for for different colors. And this this really is material specific. Different glasses have different profiles of uh, index of refraction. And some, some glasses uh, bend different, different colors of light more than others. Uh, it's not just that they have different indices of refraction, but they have different uh, rates of change of the index of refraction as a function of wavelength. And so to, to make a kind of a scientific instrument or make a real measurement with a prism, it's, it's kind of a pain. You have to calibrate. You have to send in a bunch of really well-known wavelengths of light and measure exactly where they come out. And your interpolation to measure uh, wavelengths between that is, is only going to be as good as the, the index of refraction of the glass is smooth. So there's another way that we learn to, to, uh, to separate out different colors of light, and that's that's a diffraction grading. So we've talked about that in the electromagnetism class or in, in physics 50, the lab class. So a diffraction grading is often a, a bunch of holes and uh, well, there's, there's transmissive, transmissive gratings, which are like clear films with a bunch of, bunch of um, opaque sections regularly spaced. There's reflective gratings where there's a bunch of mirrors and, and a bunch of places where the light is blocked. I think the simplest thing to draw is a transmissive grating. And so if a plane wave approaches this grating, it'll separate out into, into uh, well, some of it's going to go straight through. And there, all the colors go straight through. But some of it's going to diffract. And the red light is going to diffract more than the blue light. So. The blue light acts more particle-like, and red light acts slightly more wave-like. And so any of these wave interference phenomena are going to be bigger for the, the red light. And with the diffraction grading, you can very carefully uh, scrape uh, scrape a mirror or very carefully make these, uh, these holes and, and blockers uh, very uniform. And just from the theory of diffraction gratings that, that we talked about previously, and that we'll, again, maybe encounter next week, uh, you can take spectra of light that comes out. Um, now, again, to get super accurate, the, the, any machine that you, you have to, to take these spectra uh, often has some, something called periodic error, where if you're scraping, you're scraping and you're turning a little gear and scraping and turning a little gear and scraping and turning a little gear, unless that gear is perfectly round, the little holes and walls will kind of bunch up for a while and then spread out and bunch up for a while and spread out. And that'll, that'll affect how, how accurately and how smoothly your, your diffraction grading works. So even these need to be calibrated. Um, 
but uh, you know, basically, you you take this light and you spread it out and you measure it, and the light gets. Uh, you can either move a detector or change the angle of the diffraction grating. There's a couple of different ways you could do this, but there's kind of a limit as to how accurate you can get these these spectra here. Uh, and and the example we'll consider today is uh, is uh, uh, sodium light, where there are two spectral lines that are really close together. And if you have two, two lines that are really close together, these will diffract and they'll, they'll often overlap. And you either have to make the diffraction grading extremely accurately and, and also make the, the path extremely long um, in order to see the, the fact that these lines are really close together. Uh, or, you, know, you, you basically can't, can't do it with, with all but the, the most expensive kind of diffraction grading setups. Uh, but today we'll take a spectrum in a different way using an in interference pattern. And I think this is sort of one of the, one of the coolest things in, in optics is, is that we can actually use an interferometer which has no components that are sensitive to the color of light. And just by moving mirrors around, we can work out what the, what the spectrum of the light coming in is. So let me, let me give the example here of, uh, of the sodium doublet. So if you've ever seen a sodium street lamp, they tend to be the sort of more yellowy, orangey kind of street lamps. Uh, they, they're just sodium vapor in a glass tube zapped with a lot of electricity. And because of spin orbit coupling, which hopefully you are learning about or will learn about soon in, in your quantum mechanics class, there's one particular emission line that gets split ever so slightly. And, and that's that's the bright the bright line that that makes the, the lamp. So there's plenty of light to work with. But the two wavelengths, lambda one is 589.0 nanometers, and lambda two is 589.6 nanometers. So these are really close in spectra, uh, and they're sort of in the orangish yellowish region. You know that that those sort of sickly sodium uh, sodium street lights emit, and what we're going to do is we are going to put this light into a Michelson interferometer and analyze what comes out as a function of how you move the mirror. And we're going to see that uh, we can recover the difference. Well, the, both the sum and the difference of these two. And in fact, what's interesting, in prisms and in diffraction gratings, the closer these are, the harder it is to resolve them. What we'll see in, in the Michelson interferometer, it's the opposite. The closer these are, the, the easier it is, the, the less accurate of a micrometer you need to, to, measure, to measure the fact that there is a difference and measure that difference. So let me just plump down a few terms so we'll have them later. This lambda one oscillates at an angular frequency of two pi F1. And F1, it's in Hertz, so one over seconds. So in order to get that from wavelength and the speed of light, it's meters per second over meters. And the same thing for, for lambda two, omega two is similar. Uh, and it makes, more sense in terms of a lot of the intermediate steps to write things in terms of omegas, just for uh, for ease of ease of doing math. So uh, even though you're much, you know, nanometers are, are simple and their distances, um, you know, write things in terms of terahertz, but not even real terahertz, angular terahertz. But uh, we're never going to plug in the uh, the intermediate numbers. At the end of the day, we'll we'll just work with wavelengths. But all the intermediate stuff is going to be in in uh, angular frequencies. All right, so, so when you, well, let me draw the, the interferometer again. So here you have your, your lamp, your source. So this is a sodium lamp, some uh, probably doesn't look like that kind of light bulb. It looks more like a longer, longer skinnier light bulb with an electrode on the top and electrode on the bottom. And you zap it with high voltage and it emits 
it's that sickly yellow sodium light. And that's going to go hit a half silver mirror. And so half of the light is going to reflect up. And of course, I'm drawing rays, but really we're going to treat these as, as plane waves. So half light is going to reflect up, half light is going to go through. And we have a fixed mirror up here and a movable mirror over here. And off of both of these mirrors, you're going to get some reflection back. And the light that comes back, there's going to be one copy coming from the, the movable mirror. And let, let me just write that this, this mirror moves a distance d from the equilibrium position. So when d is 0, these mirrors are the same distance. And uh, so half the light is going to come, come down. Half the light's going to go back into the lamp, but we just ignore that. Here again, half the light is going to come down, and half the light is going to go back, back into the lamp. Uh, and we just ignore the light that goes back to the lamp. So if you're looking here with your eye, which I don't actually recommend with our actual sodium light in the lab because it's really bright, but if you were to look at it, if, if these mirrors are aligned properly, you should see two copies of this lamp. One, one looks, well, each of the copies is half as bright because half of the light has, has gone back into the lamp. Um, but more importantly, each of them is going to be roughly in the same place, and one is going to be a distance d behind the other. So as I move this mirror back, 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 the light that you see that comes from reflecting off this mirror makes this lamp look like it's a little bit further back. Um, and if these mirrors were slightly misaligned, if I, if I don't turn the knobs accurately to keep them uh, exactly perpendicular, that you'll see the two, the two copies of the, of the sodium lamp aren't, aren't going to be behind each other. They're going to be slightly off. So it's really easy to align this thing. You, you put a filter on here so it's not quite as annoyingly bright. And you turn the knobs until the, the two lamps are right on top of each other. And then you turn this knob. And uh, it's a little bit hard to see them uh, in, in front of each other. But uh, uh, you can, you can uh, get equal path length through uh, through looking at those circ the, the bullseye patterns like you like we saw in the lab with the laser. But what's more interesting about this lamp than the laser is we actually have two frequencies in play and they're all, they're both about equally bright. So let me uh, if let me kind of un unfold this interferometer and we did this we did this in the laser lamp. This looks the same as if you're looking at two copies of the source. So there's one, one lamp with electrodes. Here's another lamp with electrodes separated by a distance, not d, but 2d, because any additional, any additional motion of this mirror, uh, this path has to go that additional amount and back. So it looks like these are separated by 2d. And they're, they're just some, some overall distance away, which, which is not, not going to matter. But now the question is, what is the pattern of light that is seen either in your eye or in a photo detector for, for this input, light that's made up of two nearby frequencies? And to tackle that, let's start to write out what, let's translate all this stuff into cosines and time delays and things like that. Right, so let me tell you the, the punchline. The punchline for the more general case, where, which we'll tackle next time, is that what you see here, as you move this mirror back and forth, the pattern you see is actually the Fourier transform of the spectrum. And so for us, the spectrum is just two, two delta functions, one, one delta function at roughly this wavelength and one delta function at this wavelength. There's only two components of my spectrum. And so what I will see is the two cosines that are oscillating at different frequencies. That'll be what we'll, what we'll work toward today. And tomorrow, we'll tackle the more general case. I should call this coherence theory number one, because uh, next time will be coherence theory number two. OK, so uh, let's 
let's write what is what do we see here? So, so e, e at the detector as a function of time. So let's locate the detector at x equals zero so we don't have to worry about any x coordinates. Um, what the detector sees is it sees the source at some time plus the source at some later time, t plus tau. Right, so I'm going to define this one more thing, and this is the last thing I'm going to define. Tau is the amount of extra time it takes the light from this second copy to reach the detector. So, so tau is a, is a time, so it's 2, 2d over c. That's what tau is. So what, what we see at the detector is light from the source. It's oscillating super fast, so fast we can't so fast we can't see it, plus light that's delayed a little bit. And for, for, um, for our specific example today, I'm gonna write this as E source uh, This is gonna be some overall E naught. I don't really care much about the, the overall height of the spectra. That depends on how bright the lamp is and how well aligned everything is and how sensitive this detector is. So overall constants aren't gonna make too much of a difference, but there's gonna be some, uh, some amount of cosine of omega one T plus cosine of omega two T. So these are the two different wavelengths, frequencies of light being emitted by these by each of these copies of the lamp. Uh, that's what the source is. And one's gonna be delayed with respect to the other. So if I were to calculate E, what I see at the detector, it's gonna be a sum of four terms, right? These things evaluated at T and these things, these things evaluated at T plus tau. But that's not what I actually see. What I actually see is the intensity. What I actually see is the intensity. And intensity, and let me just write this as uh, as uh, proportional to. So the intensity, uh, well, let me, let me see. I might, I might get this off by a factor of two, but again, we don't worry too much about the overall level because that depends on all kinds of sensitivity. So this is the time average of the electric field that I detect squared over some, some constant to get it to the right units. And I, this might be two, two eta or it might be a half. I, I, uh, I have to remind myself of that. But in my notes, I just have this as proportional to. So I'm not, I'm not even gonna bother with this, with this eta. I'm just gonna write this as proportional to, and I'm not even gonna bother with the E naught. I'm just, all I care about is the shape of the spectra. So it's proportional to the time average of these four terms squared. So let me write the four terms. It's gonna be E squared. So E source is gonna be cosine of omega one t, sorry, that's a little bit, plus cosine of omega two t, plus cosine of omega one t plus tau, plus cosine of omega two t plus tau. All of that squared, so you can imagine that's kind of a messy, there are eight terms. But when I take, oops, this should be a, I have a square bracket here, this should be a time average. So when I square this, so there are eight terms, but when I take the time average of this, almost all of those terms are oscillating. And when I take the time average, you can ask, well, how, how long do I have to average over well, you have to average over a couple, you know, enough cycles of light to get to get an average. But these things are are oscillating at terahertz, hundreds of terahertz, and my detectors aren't even even sort of super fancy expensive detectors aren't sensitive to more than a few gigahertz. So the detectors themselves perform a time average. So I don't actually have to do any averaging by hand. It's just physically done in the detector itself. 
Um, and I'm going to leave this. I'm going to leave this math exercise for for the homework. Uh, just sort of picking out. Basically, you just write this out. You do some trig identities, and you say what's what's left. Is it oscillating at some terahertz? Then, if it's oscillating around zero at some terahertz, that's going to average away to zero. And there's only a few terms that that are left at the end of the day, and that's that's going to be uh, it's going to be proportional to uh, two. I'll write it. I'll write this in two different ways. So this is proportional to two plus cosine two plus cosine cosine of omega one tau right because all the t's are gone they're time averaged away plus cosine of omega two tau all right so so the the fast oscillations the terahertz oscillations are unobservable once those are averaged away i have an intensity here which is observable and this intensity depends on tau which depends on d which i control through a knob so so as i turn this knob what i see is uh, I see a sum of two cosines, one oscillating at one frequency plus one oscillating at a very close similar frequency, omega-2. Um, and I can rewrite this using the, the following. So, so what does that look like? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do one more trig, trig identity kind of thing, um, just because it'll make the graph a little bit cleaner. So if I write omega-1 as some average omega minus delta omega over two and omega two, if I write that as some average omega plus delta omega over two. Uh, let me see, yeah. Then these delta omega is just the difference in these two omegas and omega is just the the average of the two omegas, then I can write this in the following way. I can write this as two times one plus cosine of omega tau times cosine of delta omega over two tau. All right, so you can imagine if I plug in omega one here, I plug in omega two here, and I use the, the sum and difference trig identities. Um, some of the terms cancel because they're the same between these, and I'm left with just this. So it's a product of two terms. And one of these terms is quite fast. And one of them is quite slow because the difference the difference in omegas between these is quite slow. Um, the the sum is quite fast, but again these aren't these are uh, frequencies in in time, but nothing is happening in time. I've already done the time average. What's happening is this this tau here is secretly a distance, it's secretly this separation in distance. So let me plot what this what this looks like when I actually when I actually do the experiment. Uh, I want to erase. I'll erase this. If I were to plot this bottom line on a graph, it's some some constant offset, right? Plus the product of two cosines, and that looks like this. So here I'll start at d equals zero, although you could have d be positive or negative. So this is d equals zero. D will go that way, and I'll plot my intensity. Um, it's it's some some fast cosine t 
times some slower cosine. So I'm not drawing the fast cosine super well, hopefully I'm drawing the slow cosine a little bit better. So let's, let's turn these back into, into wavelengths so we can actually see how this, how this, uh, how this pattern goes with D. So, uh, let's see, I want to keep, I want to keep everything maybe except this. So well, well, actually, before we turn this back into wavelength, let me just label, label the plot here. So maybe, maybe instead of labeling it D, I'll, I'll label it tau. That's a little bit easier to work out from. So the, the fast, fast frequency here, fast fringes. So as you, as you turn this knob. You'll see bright dark, bright dark, bright dark, bright dark, bright dark, and it'll sort of as you turn the knob more bright dark, bright dark. It'll be a little bit less, a sort of fade into some average brightness where not much is happening. And you keep turning the knob, and it gets the brighter, the brights get brighter, and the darks get darker, brighter, darker, brighter, darker, and pretty soon you're you're at sort of all nothing, all nothing, all nothing, like we were with the laser, all nothing, and then it'll fade fade into nothingness. Um, the envelope of this. Cosine that that you're multiplying it by, so that that dotted line here. Okay, I'm gonna try a different color. This dotted envelope here. That is that is this slower cosine. So that is the cosine of delta omega over two times tau. And we can translate that. Into uh, into uh, an actual uh, distance that we have to move d by. So so let me do that. Uh, so this is this is cosine of well delta omega over two is I'll just say well let me let me write it as delta omega times tau over two makes my life a little bit easier. So cosine delta omega is omega one minus omega two. So this is uh, two pi c over lambda one minus two pi c over lambda two and uh, tau over two. Well, tau is two d over c. So tau over two is just d over c and the C's all cancel, that's convenient. And so now I have, this is equal to cosine of two pi times some one over lambda one minus one over lambda two, times some sort of a per meter constant times D. And now the question is how how much do I have to turn this D? How, how far do I have to move this, this uh, micrometer to go from a maxima here, maximum visibility, where uh, you see bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark quite dramatically to minimum visibility, where if I turn the knob a little bit either way, not much changes. I'm just sort of in this sort of uniform, not super bright, but also not super dark and barely changing region. So. So that happens when the argument of, of the cosine is 90 degrees. So I can work out what that looks like. Uh, I guess I finally have to erase the interferometer. Okay. So to go from max visibility where these interference fringes, these bright and dark bands are 
at their maximum contrast to minimum. stability, um, D goes uh, by, by what? Well, I just set the argument of this cosine uh, equal to 90 degrees. So here's 90 degrees, here's 90 more degrees, here's 90 more degrees. There's a, the final uh, number to get 360. So when, when two pi times one over lambda one plus one over lambda two D equals 90 degrees, pi over two, that is when I've gone from maximum visibility to minimum visibility. So D, uh, let's see. I am different by a factor of two for some reason, but maybe no, I think I'm. I think I'm right here. Okay, so, um, so if I if I were to solve here, the pi's cancel. I get some fours. So d, where this happens, is one over four over lambda one plus four over lambda two, and for our particular lambdas here, this is kind of a reasonable amount. This is zero point one five millimeters. So, so this is an amount you can actually turn a micrometer by hand and measure. And so one of the, in, in the homework and in the lab, I'm gonna ask you to do some of those trig identities or actually it's much cleaner to do it as complex exponentials. Um, and I'm gonna take a video tomorrow of me doing this in the lab and showing, showing the sodium lamp, showing the interferometer, showing bright and dark fringes, sort of fading into nothingness and then coming back and then fading into sort of a uniform mush and then coming back. And uh, by taking careful measurements of the distance from here to here, or really the distance from minima to minima, that's what we actually want to measure. So the distance from minima to minima is twice this. If I call this delta, delta D here, if I translate tau into D, delta D, the distance between minima is 0.3. Millimeters. And that's something that you can easily measure by hand on a micrometer. And so we've turned extremely close spectral lines, something that's really hard to see on a, with a prism or a diffraction grating, into a measurement we can make just with a micrometer to, to measure the, the difference. But one thing that's not obvious is the, uh, the closer these things are, right? The, the closer lambda one and lambda two are, the smaller, the closer the omegas are, and therefore the smaller delta omega is, and the smaller delta omega is, the slower this cosine goes. And so the more, the more I have to turn before I get uh, bright fringes to turn, to turn into kind of a uniform mush back into bright fringes. So with this technique, it's actually easier to measure things that are closer together in frequency because this, um, this spreads out, uh, spreads out the, uh, the features more. So that's the, the technique of, of using interferometers to take spectra. Now, most of this time I spent on this particular example where I have two very close, closely spaced spectral lines that are hard to distinguish through other methods. But the general technique, if I, if I go back to here, I have some constant offset just because the intensity always has to be positive, plus some amount of each of these two frequencies, which, which makes up this, this pattern here. And if I were to go through and, uh, and be more careful about it, which I'll do next time, and I say, well, instead of starting with equal amounts of this and, and that, if I started with you know, say A lambda one and B amount of lambda two, that would translate into A squared, because it's an intensity, amount of this cosine plus B squared amount of that cosine. And even more generally, if I had some spectra that was made up of a huge number of cosines with arbitrary coefficients, 
that would, I go through all the math with the time averages and the trig identities and everything else, and I would get some constant offset, plus each of those cosines, not in time anymore, but in, in tau, in, the, in D, in terms of this, this micrometer. And because spectra in time, which are too fast to measure, translate nicely into spectra as a function of some knob I can just turn, uh, that, that allows me to take arbitrary spectra using this, this technique. And uh, because what you measure is, is the, the cosines themselves, and what you want are the coefficients, the a, a squareds and the b squareds, in order to, to have some measurement of some crazy, crazy waveform and pluck out the coefficients here, the technique that's used mathematically is the Fourier, Fourier transform that asks what is the coefficient of each of these cosine terms and you know, how much of each frequency went into this signal and how much of each frequency that goes into this sweep as a function of D is the same, we'll see next time, as how much of each frequency goes into the arbitrary spectrum as a function of time. And so that's a, that's a technique that the chemists call Fourier, Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, FTIR. And the reason why the chemists tend to use it for infrared is that uh, this, you know, all the wavelengths are bigger in the infrared. And so things are a little bit less sensitive to vibrations and bumps. And uh, you can, all you need is a single, single infrared detector at the bottom of this interferometer. And you, you just make this interferometer move a little bit and you take a bunch of data points at different distances. And then you can compute the Fourier transform of that and you get out what the infrared spectrum of the light that was being emitted uh, was. And uh, we, we can do that in optical light, invisible light too. Uh, it's just you have to be very, very careful with your, your vibrations and your turnings of the knobs. So this is quite a general technique of taking spectra with just one detector and turning, turning a knob to, to separate the, the two sources. In the in the micro center from, all right, and we'll uh, we'll go through all the the math for for the general case next time. But I wanted to show you an example where we just have a very simple spectra composed of two two wavelengths that are roughly equivalent, and show how that translates into an interference pattern as a function of tau or or two d that uh, that has some nice nice properties that you can back out information about the the spectrum. All right, any any questions about that? Otherwise, look forward to the video that I will hopefully make tomorrow and the homework uh, involving analyzing data that looks exactly like this. Although the data you'll analyze is just make measurements of where the, where the nulls are, because those are the easiest things to measure. All right, I will see you all on Wednesday.